All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another Let's Play for Threat Gen Red versus Blue, the cybersecurity gaming simulation platform. Uh, we'll be playing as the blue team today. Um, and in this platform, you get to be offensive, you get to be defensive, you get to learn cybersecurity skills in an actual fun and interesting way. If you watched last week's stream, you saw me absolutely get handed uh, handedly by the by the AI, but I'm hoping to uh, perform better. Joined with us is Clint Bow Dungeon, uh, lead developer for ThreatGen. Clint, thanks for being here. Well, I, I, I kind of have to be here. It's a ThreatGen broadcast now. It really is. It is a real uh, thing. All the socials are down there on the bottom. So we're going to get into it. But uh, any any opening thoughts before we dig in, Clint? You know, I, I think that for anybody viewing, um, you know, just kind of realize that this is this is kind of a, a live dry run where we're going to be streaming these Let's Plays a lot, not only with, you know, with Gerald and myself, sorry, Jerry and myself. I forget. I know you better now. Um, but, you know, with with both of us playing, maybe I'll, I'll stream some, he'll stream some, but also with guests from uh, from the community playing as well. And I think the main purpose of this is is really, I think, while, while people why pe while people are viewing this, it's important to realize that we're not just streaming this just to show people some game. The whole purpose of this is to gain real world cybersecurity insight, whether you're interested in the red team or the blue team through this simulation. So we're kind of demoing the game, but it, or the, the, well, it's a game, but it's also a cybersecurity simulation. We're demoing that, but we're also doing this to, during these streams, to show people the consequences or the benefits of different things that we do uh, because this does mimic real life. So I'll leave it at that. Absolutely. So feel free to jump in chat, say what's going on. I see you in there watching. Let's dig into the game. All right, Clint. So we are going to be the blue team. We get to pick what uh, organization we want. I'm feeling fancy and wanting to do random. Any any concerns with going random on our infrastructure? No, that's always fun. That way, that okay. way, you know, we don't know what to expect. We're just we're we're, we're kind of it, it's it, it mimics real life. We've just been hired, and we don't really know what our network is. Exactly. We just bought, been brought on site over the new CISO, and we've been told deal with it. Okay, guys, like any other uh, Threat Gen Red versus Blue game start, we get a little bit of an intro on what we're doing here, and there is um, an explanation of what win conditions are. So essentially, in this, in this platform, this simulation platform, we are defending our organization and adversaries, AI, are actively attacking. So each turn, it's going to you know, the, the, the environment's going to change. Our threat landscape is going to change. So we're going to do our best to defend ourselves and uh, protect the organization we've been hired to protect. Okay. Again, if we have at any point any questions, we'll be able to hit that question mark to get Wikipedia-like information on what something is. And um, let's just dig into it. I feel like this is one of those platforms that's better served by experience. Okay. Let's see what we got here. Looks like we're working at an oil and gas uh, organization. Good morning, Rolando Brooks. Good morning, Devin Jackson. Chris Word, good to see you. Good morning. Guys, I'm the CISO at an oil and gas uh, refinery, and they got nothing in here. I have been given $50,000, you can see at the top left, for my budget, and three analysts on my team. We'll say one senior analyst and two junior analysts. Ready to rock and roll. Okay, so Clint... I just got to tell you, as a uh, cybersecurity professional, when I come into this organization that has nothing, really the first couple of things I'm thinking are policies and procedures. Um, and I'm going to, I'm actually going to, if you're on stream, I'm going to tell you something in a second that is how I feel about it in real life. I would do asset inventory, asset inventory, because it's the number one control in your SANS uh, CIS. 20, now 18 controls. You need to know what you have in order to even know how to protect it. So I'm just going to do that anyways. And going back to the tree, really policies and procedures are going to unlock this skill tree right here, two-factor auth. 
uh, encrypting IR, very important. I will say though, policies and procedures are critically important because they define what the norms are at an organization. But sometimes when you get into an organization and they don't have say two-factor authentication, you need to make that a priority, right? Like writing a policy that says you're going to have two-factor auth. Um, yes, you should do that, but getting it in place technically, putting that control in there and limiting the damage of, you know, potential damage is absolutely critical. You, you know, could also and, and make I, the argument. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I like your comment and your argument is valid because, and I'll just say from a developer perspective, originally we set out to try to enforce good behavior with unlocking certain aspects to so teach you good behavior by enforcing it. Um, but there is an aspect of, say, for example, I agree, two-factor authentication, you don't need to write a policy for, before it, before implementing. So I, I do see some development changes on the horizon. Yeah, it, it is interesting. Also, I got to tell you guys, we only have two analysts left to work. And, you know, policies and procedures take two analysts. Gateway firewall takes one analyst. So we can't do both. So you really have to make those choices. Not having a gateway firewall is nauseating but we need to get to that two-factor authentication. So let's do this. Okay, we've used all our resources. This is our network environment that we are responsible for protecting. Let's go ahead and end the turn. What's up, Darcel? I'm glad you're enjoying that GRC course. I've got a lot of great feedback on it. I hope it's delivering value to you. Okay, guys, it's day two. We came in, we got our coffee. Let's check how the team's doing. They're still busy here. And you can see in the action log that they're continuing to work, right? So this actually does mimic real life, guys. You don't you don't just like snap your fingers and have policies and procedures. You need to understand what your environment looks like, what regulatory obligations you have, um, what the overall governance structure is of the environment, and um, what, you know, someone actually has to write the policies, then it has to go through review, general counsel needs to look at it, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So these, this is pretty realistic that it takes time. Also and that's why time is represented here, right? And and in this simulation, we represent time in the aspect of turns because in real life, something can take weeks. So it's very difficult to represent weeks if you have a real time strategy game. So that's why we chose to go with a turn based strategy here. Yeah, I love it. Format. And uh, I want to give a, a quick little shout out since we have a few minutes here to Dr. Monshine. It's good to see him. He was uh, one of the professors in my master's computer science program out of Massachusetts. Great guy. Good to see you there. All right, guys, since we do have a minute and a half before our, our work day is over, I do want to take a minute and look at our environment really quickly, okay? Because this is something you really should pay attention to. This environment that we've been hired to protect looks like it has some kind of infrastructure IT services right here, right? We've got a domain controller, mail server. We have what appears to be some endpoints, right? So we've got, you know, Carl and accounting and Clint Bow Dungeon right here in uh, R&D. You know, got to look out for that guy. Always standing up his remote access stuff. Look at that. I do have my name in there. By the way, a lot of these uh, host names are generated randomly, but we did put some Easter eggs in there. I'm one. I'm a big I, I love it. Very appropriate for you. So um, LinkedIn user, is this game free? Nope. Nope. This game is not free. Clint, you want to speak to it while I, I continue to think about how I'm going to do this? Yep. So this is the professional version of this simulation platform is available at threatgen.com. And there are different price points. There's different subscription levels. We have it for individuals as well as for organizations. You, uh, somewhere in there, you can see the the website. I thought we had a website on here somewhere. Either way, it's threatgen.com. And then if you just want a little uh, community version preview of it, you can get it for $15 on Steam. But the professional version has all the bells and the whistles and the extra scenarios and all of that. Yep, absolutely. Thanks. Great question too, by the way. Carrie, yep, you can get it uh, a couple bucks, 15 15 bucks, I guess, on Steam. And obviously the platform is going to have a little bit more functionality. Um, you can see right here, you're asking where the game link is. I've got it on um, on the chat here. Where is it? Where is it? I'll post in <laughs> chat, both of them. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to end my turn. I don't know if it's posting over to both. Um... LinkedIn and YouTube. Yeah. 
It should be, I should have, it should be in the show description below, both on LinkedIn and YouTube. It Like I've put it in the show description, so you should be able to find it there as well. Okay. Also, hey, chat, I just want to, like for those of you, oh, we've got one person in there right now. Um, I want to know if this looks better or not. Let me know in chat if, if having it uh, with us on the side looks better. Okay. We are still working away at this work. So it seems like a huge investment, a couple different days of work, but unlocking the skill tree is critically important and unlocking this skill tree is critically important. So essentially we are putting in the time to unlock the, the actual functionalities that we need. So let's go ahead and end the term. Don't See, forget about a firewall. Of... Remember, this game starts you off with not even a firewall. Don't forget about that. Yes. So our asset inventory is complete, which is perfect. And our policies and procedures are developed, which is perfect. So just looking at our action tree, we now have unlocked vulnerability assessment, mapping, certification. And we've also unlocked a lot of um, skills here, two-factor auth or capabilities. Uh, SDLC, security awareness, which I would argue is very valuable. But Clint brings up a good point. Let's get that gateway firewall in uh, post haste. So we've put a, we're going to put a gateway firewall in. And personally, I like, as I mentioned, okay, so you may think putting the SIM in is the next best bet, possible bet. But I think when you think of a SIM, guys, think about the NIST cybersecurity framework, right? Like you've got, these five different categories, identify, protect, left of boom, before bad stuff happens, detect, respond, recover, right of boom, after bad stuff happens. I really want to shore up my defenses before I start worrying about detecting stuff. And this is a philosophical decision that people would argue with me on uh, if you have a different philosophical perspective on it, but that's okay. I'm going to be doing 2FA, which is super important to me. In fact, when I play this game on the defensive side, I feel like I'm pretty consistent with my first couple moves. It's like chess. I have my opening moves and that's what I do. All right, Clint. Um, as, just to finish really quick, we've got our endpoints. We've got our DMZ space, which is you know between the internet and, well, uh, this network diagram kind of appears different than what I would, I would envision. But you can see this is our, our DMZ space and a terminal server for end users to remote into. We've got our, uh, Clint, can you talk about these two different segments over here since you're more of the industrial control system person? Yeah, so if you look at the left side, now this is a flat network right now, if you look at it, there's no network segmentation, but you do have two, two segments or two sections to the industrial control systems network. On the left side, you have the DCS or the distributed control system. Oh, sorry, up above where, he, where he's kind of circling there. That's basically a process control network. That's where your where you're going to have your 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 terminals, your human machine interfaces, your your SCADA servers if you have SCADA. And here we do down in the uh, in the the layer one and layer zero down. We have the plant environment on the left, which is the distributed control system, which controls the plant the plant operations like the refinery here, and um, and I guess I guess we're in the we're in a pipeline, so we kind of we have a little I guess we have a little bit of a refinery there, and on the right side. You have the SCADA network, which is going to remotely that that's your remote devices, such as your your remote um, your radios and your PLCs, your programmable logic controllers that control functionality of the pipeline valves, etc. Okay, and also you know you could see this right here. Like think about a pipeline that's like way out in the you know the middle of nowhere, Alaska. That radio communication that controls that pipeline that's what this represents. So this is like a distant thing. All right, let's end our turn. While he's doing that, while you're ending your turn, I do want to point out to people that are watching, especially on LinkedIn, we did say this would be a 1.8 preview. Um, however, um, I got sick this weekend and didn't release 1.8 to the portal that Jerry is playing right now. Uh, so the 1.8 will uh, will actually drop tomorrow. And then we'll do another live stream later to preview that. Yes. Thank you. Good to know, Clint. We will be doing these Let's Play uh, more frequently, as Clint mentioned at the intro. <laughs> Maybe I'll learn to be uh, more offensive than I already am. Okay. We got our gateway firewall installed. I want to give a shout out to uh, Kyle and Ian, Ian Olua. 
if I if I butchered that, I'm sorry. Uh, talking about how the side uh, layout makes more sense. So Clint, uh, going forward, we'll, we'll probably throw ourselves on the side here. Okay, so our firewall was built, which you can now see over here, right? This firewall came in. That wasn't here before. Very nice. Continuing to bolster our infrastructure, we have to wait two more turns for 2FA because we're doing... Here's another reality, guys. Okay? This is real life. Just to say 2FA is like, yes, it's you. maybe you could technically implement it in one day because you're using a cloud service. But what makes sense? Do you use Microsoft Azure MFA? Do you use Okta? Do you use Duo? You literally have to go out and do market research and figure out what is the best one for your environment situation, for adoption in the environment, for the cost, right? Maybe Duo is perfect, but they're four X times what Okta costs, especially after Okta's recent issue, right? So there's a lot of factors at play when you're deciding what solutions to buy. So, you know, these times, yes, they're real because it's not only technical implementation, which a lot of us engineers think of. There's a lot of making the right decision, moving deliberately forward as you as you build a program. People who just get a lot of money and recklessly build programs, there's often a lot of bad decisions made, right? And then someone else has to come in and clean it up and it's a hot mess on fire. So I, I appreciate that ThreatGen has done this uh, to make it more realistic. Okay, so we've this got one person... Radio. Yes, exactly. We've got one person. We want to maximize our resources, right? Put those people to work. We could create IR procedures. We could implement strong Wi-Fi. We could do backups. ICS safe so testing Keep methods. in mind with the backups, yeah. Backups is a per asset thing. Um, and so that's going to give you the ability to, if, a, if you do get compromised, just like real life, if you have a backup on a, an asset, you can roll back to a previous restore point. So the backup, you have to create your backup procedures and policy. You have to create your plan, your backup plan first. Then you can start creating restore points on assets. Okay, that's good to know. I I'm going to go ahead and put a sim in um, just because I feel like, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a foundational piece. MFA, SecOps, security awareness are all foundational. And security awareness costs uh, two people and we only have one. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. End the turn. We got Base, a.k.a. Casey Gaska in chat. He's got 40 minutes until his next meeting, so he's hanging out with us. Good to see you, Base. Congratulations to him and the, the team um, that did the Trace Labs CTF uh, last week. Did really well. Trace Labs' mission is really excellent. Okay, Clint. We're still rolling out 2FA. We finally selected our vendor. Now we're waiting for the, uh, the, the, the hardware tokens to get mailed out to our different facilities. So it's going to take another day, okay? So keep in mind that in game here, just like in real life, early low-hanging fruit tends to be your untrained users. Your users are the front line of defense. So... Yeah. It, you know, things like user awareness training in the beginning here are going to help shore up defenses that plus 2FA or MFA. Uh, it's listed as 2FA here, but that's going to help you shore up your defenses against early low hanging fruit like social engineering attacks and campaigns. So yep. just keep that in mind. I agree 100%. Uh, unfortunately, 2FA takes a while and it, it's eating up our resources. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make um, strong Wi-Fi. I, I don't typically do that, but I'm wondering... Ooh, hold on. I'm going to install a network security sensor. Okay, guys? I think it's important to get some um, some awareness of potential compromises. So let's do that really quickly. Yeah, and your network security sensors will give you an indicator that there's an attack happening, while only mm -hmm. your endpoint protection, which also acts as a host-based detection, will alert you that in a an asset has been compromised okay that's good to know and guys i want to tell you so you can drop network sensors in four different places this is another learning opportunity so if you think that you just stick a, a network sensor at the front door like over where this firewall gateway is to capture everything that's not necessarily true because you can get in through terminal server you could be on site and physically plug in right so 
having the idea that you all traffic goes through the front door is an antiquated concept. And, and it's part of the reason why zero trust architecture is a thing today. So that's why in the, in the simulation, you can see that I have four options on where, where to drop this. Now, if I was a corporate network, I would probably put it over here around my corporate IT infrastructure stuff. But because I get paid to protect our services of pushing oil and, and gas to our, you know, uh, gas stations and vendors and stuff. I'm most concerned with right here in our, our uh, PCS network segment. So let's give that what it, the attention it deserves. Now, we've still used all our resources. Quick question, Clint. What, these guys light up when I hover over them. What does clicking on them do? I didn't see your cursor. Where? It's on the, the, the three people. <clears throat> Right. So I think if, if you if you click on the money, that will automatically add request budget to your action queue. If you click okay. on the staff, it will. Um, oh, we ran out of time. Um, That's okay. If you click on the staff, it will automatically request or um, add higher new staff to your queue. OK. OK, so we've got network security sensor and 2FA. We're feeling good. To, as Clint mentioned earlier. Security awareness is absolutely invaluable, okay? And actually, for those of you who are taking the GRC course right now, I saw a couple of you say that you're doing it while while hanging out with us in chat. I do a whole module on security awareness. It's literally so valuable to risk reduction at your organization. It doesn't get a lot of, you know, uh, prime time because it's not some cool technical control. But guys, to Clint's point earlier... You have thousands of end users in your environment, all with their own phones and maybe laptops, going to Starbucks, leaving things in Ubers, you know, letting a random person carrying a ladder through a door. Like you need all of those people to be educated. The scale of what you get from risk reduction by training your end users effectively is huge. So super important. Definitely going to do it in the simulator right now. Now I've still got one resource, Clint. And I'm thinking of how to how to exercise it. If I could I make do... a suggestion. Yep. Go ahead. So we're starting to take care of our of our social engineering low hanging threats. I would either start to install, I would start thinking about physical security too. So we're we're starting to take care of our our our, our cyber low hanging fruit. We need to start thinking about the physical too. So I would either start installing USB security on your your critical devices like your 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 process control devices like your engineering workstation SCADA server things like that or i would start to put in things that give you the biggest impact to physical security like installing i know you hate this but installing video surveillance makes it harder for on-site intruders to continue to penetrate through the the physical network I know you think there's a disparity between the cost of physical security versus other things, which can be addressed, however, uh, in development. But for now, you also have you, you do have to think about your physical security because whenever I was doing red teaming full time, we always successfully gained access to critical assets using physical uh, penetration testing means. And that's still true to today. I mean, if you think about things like Stuxnet um, other and other and I hate to use the S word, but if you think about these things, go ahead and make your move. But while I talk, but um, make a decision. But if you think I, about, I will be things, installing video surveillance, and I'll, okay. I'll explain my decision after you're done uh, speaking. Yeah, my last sentence was simply that you know it, it, adversaries do the same things that we penetration testers do in terms of red teaming, and physical security is often overlooked. So I decided to do the um, the video surveillance, right? And it is incredibly expensive, which gives me pause to invest in it. But to Clint's point, instead of you know trying to secure each endpoint, if I can put a video surveillance around this whole thing, then the likelihood of a, a, a rogue USB being plugged in, in my mind, goes down a little lower because the, the, the adversary never physically gets to the machine to put the USB drive in. It doesn't eliminate the risk but it, it lowers the risk. Okay. So we now, have, I, I, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead. I have, we have, we have a couple questions from the audience yep. that I would like to. I was to... just about to address those. Yeah. So Kyle asks, uh, never seen an alert from a network center. So how does that show up? Well, Kyle, remember 
we we put a SIM in place here, right? And the SIM unlocks the network security sensor. So imagine if you will, we've got this really nice appliance plugged in line and it's collecting all sorts of telemetry, maybe doing a little bit of insights and all the raw data uh, is being thrown to a SIM, right? And it might notify us and say, hey, we've seen some correlations of some weird behavior, um, you know, like going to weird C2 traffics or seeing lateral movement, right? You really don't want to see east-west traffic between um, endpoints. So that could alert you. And then you get richer data from those network sensors in your SIM. So normally the audit logs that are coming out of like um, a regular firewall or something like that, it's good. But when you have like Zeek logs, you can get a much more focused on information security value uh, telemetry in into your SIM so you can move faster and, and identify um, malicious traffic or anomalous traffic. And that's kind of what I think we're talking about here. In game, well, it'll show up well, as a red target. So in game, if um, in the simulation, if you have something that's been targeted by a network attack, it'll show up as a red uh, kind of flashing target on the asset that's being targeted. Oh, good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Don't worry, guys. Things are going to go sideways here. We're still in the honeymoon phase of our CISO job, so we haven't had to explain ourselves yet to the CEO. A couple other good okay. questions here. So we had, um, you know, we had a LinkedIn user ask, is, is, is network segmentation or VLANs implementation possible in this simulation? Yes. And that is very important, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But network segmentation is possible in the game, and we will get to that. And then... We also hard, this hard is to great. do though in real life. Hard to do in real yeah, life. Yeah, that's why that's why we have to take our time here. But uh, a great question is: Can you install locks and data uh, on data jacks to prevent your rogue access points? We don't have that in the simulation at this time, but it is on our roadmap because yes, that is a huge, huge security control for preventing rogue access points. Yep. Thanks, buddy, for the question. Also, uh, Chris is uh, Chris Christopher is asking whether or not the physical security uh, that we implemented. I think it was mostly around uh, video surveillance, but you know, does it encompass door lock systems as well? Is this is this what this install electronic locks is kind of targeting? Yeah, that's basically putting in your keypad and your so the key that, that, that's your electronic keypads instead of just a physical lock. But then then when you move forward and do your your install your your physical two two FA, that's like your thumbprint plus your keypad or something or, or your prox card plus keypad or something like that. Nice. So our whole team is still working. So we just let the turn expire. We're celebrating our second week at. Uh, Kevron oil and gas. Okay. Kevron. 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 Yes. Kevlon, maybe. You just... Kev... <laughs> we'll have to come <laughs> up with a fake name for our oil and gas company, Clint. All right, yep. guys. What? Let's see what our, our team did. We've successfully deployed security awareness training. This uh, team definitely took the GRC analyst training, definitely knocked out that module and definitely delivered great security awareness value to the organization. So let's take a look at what we're doing. We're still on a flat network, which isn't good. Um, did our video surveillance system get deployed? That's still being done. So we could still have adversaries walking on our, on our premise and that's not good. Um, I, okay. So here's another thing I want to do. I find incredible value in vulnerability assessment. Guys, changing default creds, this happens sadly. Solar winds one, two, three, you know, admin, admin. This is a huge, huge risk, especially on external facing systems. So we need to get our vulnerability assessment done. Another very high ticket uh, item, but it, you know, it's real. A vulnerability assessment program is a real thing. In fact, I would argue next to security operations, it might be the next, you know, logical thing in the maturity of an information security program is vulnerability management. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Clint, thoughts? Yeah, you number it, it a lot. De what order you do things depends on how open your network is and where you are at in your the security and maturity of your program, of course. But you definitely want to start looking at your own vulnerabilities as soon as possible so you can start patching holes and you start reducing that attack surface. But also important to look at is at some point, 
to reduce that attack surface, we also need to segment our network. And another thing we need to look at is starting to get some visibility. We have a SIM and we're starting to deploy network sensors so we could see indicators of attacks. And keep in mind, we're a flat network. So right now that one network sensor is going to have visibility over our entire network. Once we segment the network, we're gonna have to place sensors in each network segment. But we do need to start getting some visibility on our critical assets. I would start installing um, our endpoint protection slash host based intrusion detection on our you know, engineering workstation and HMIs as soon okay. as possible. These sensitive so, items over here? Yeah, so that we can see if they get compromised. Okay. All right, we can definitely do that. Um, let me look here. Do we need... We... There's a toss-up, right? There's a toss-up between when you start monitoring versus when you start reducing your attack footprint because you can start reducing your, reducing your attack footprint. We have limited resources here. So if we start reducing our attack footprint and you got tw uh, 18 seconds, 17 seconds, uh, what do you That's want to fine. do there? We're, no, we're, we're, I mean, we were done. Like, I've just okay. been letting it expire. Oh, I have no resources, yeah. So like... Some, you know, it's a, it's a toss up between it, reducing your attack footprint. Um, but while you're doing that, you may already still be compromised or at the same time, you may be monitoring, but your attack footprint is so large to where it's, you can monitor all day long, but you're still getting attacked because your attack footprint is so large. So you have to find a balance with your limited resources. Absolutely. And that's, that's why it's a job. <laughs> that's why yep. people get paid lots of money to be in charge of making those decisions because it matters. Uh, GD asks, uh, how is the game played? I don't quite get it. So GD, I don't know if you caught the beginning of the stream, but this is a cybersecurity uh, simulation platform. You can play as the offensive team, red team, or you can play as the defensive team, the blue team, which is what I'm doing right now. I am playing the role of the chief information security officer and security operations team. Clint is the lead developer of this platform. So he's providing that rich context as I operate through the simulation. It the can be played. It really... Go ahead. It, it can be played. Right now, we're playing against the computer AI, uh, the computer opponent, but it can also be played against live people. Absolutely, that's a great point. Yep, and it's it's basically turn based. I have just like real life a set amount of money, a set amount of people, resources, and I've got a whole network to cover. So because I can't secure all the things, I have to make. Uh, intelligent decisions. Now, I've got one human resource and I've got two more turns before my other two staff members free up. So let me let me look at beginning to um, secure assets. Let me see. Can I let's deploy let's install endpoint security on our enter uh, engineering workstation, okay? And just so everybody knows, what he's doing is he he there are three different ways he's commit he's taking actions and they're playing actions he can click on this uh, an, an action tree which is a hierarchy which shows you all the things you can do you can click on the assets themselves to see what you can do for that asset or you can click on the more they're they're down at the bottom or what we call the the quick actions uh which is a quick categorical version of the action tree Nice. And it's broken out into the logical areas that we do as practitioners, right? So we've got architecture, GRC, um, SecOps, uh, assessment actions, physical, PhysSec, and then <laughs> uh, getting more money in people. So that's not, that's, that's GRC's function as well, typically. Okay. So now we've got another one person. We're still waiting two turns. We need to secure some stuff here, guys. Um, Clint, again, not knowing. Well, hold on. Now, now, normally, Clint, I don't think about installing EDR on network devices like a firewall. And I see that we've done it here. You know, is that mapped to like industry practice? Like it's possible, but maybe it doesn't have the value that you would think. But because it's possible, you make it available. It's a it's a bit abstracted. So just due to the way the mechanics of the game work, think of endpoint protection on the firewall. Think of that as enabling, like um, if you have a firewall that's got, for example, Cisco has their firewall feature pack um, on, um, on routers and switches, but also firewalls have host-based intrusion detection packs that you can install on or whatever. It's a bit abstracted, but for now, 
in the end game, just know that if you want to do host space intrusion detection system, you should install endpoint protection um, as that abstract concept onto the firewalls to see if it's got compromised. You got called uh, out in chat. I see. Yeah, Darcel. All right. You are right. I am a huge advocate of resilience. It's not cybersecurity. It's cyber resiliency. No backups. Okay. So this is another one of those f philosophical choices. So in my mind, Kevron has, it, it has hired me to make sure that they continue to make oil and gas and continue to, you know, basically make money. So my focus and concern is operational uptime of the operational technology, the, the right side of this uh, network diagram. While the left side is important and, you know, accounting is important and stuff like that. As far as backups go, um, if we get ransomware, I mean, it stinks. We can rebuild, but I'm more focused on making sure that the the pipeline doesn't get blown up or um you know, the, the engineering workstation doesn't get compromised from an integrity perspective. So that's, that's kind of where I'm going, you know, whether it's right or wrong, I'm not hundred percent sure, but like traditional infrastructure or, or uh, businesses, I'm much more focused on protecting that. Let me do a quick little th uh, thing here. I'm going to do endpoint security before my turn ends up, but Darcel, I do appreciate you, uh, uh, calling calling out uh, something that I have preached on Simply Cyber many times. Oh no, guys! Look at all these! Look at all these! There's this your is... vulnerability report. Okay, guys. So, <laughs> so this is the reality. Yeah, and out you of just service. did the same mistake you did last time. We have a problem. We have a problem. I didn't do a vulnerability scan. I did vulnerability. Oh, I did. I did. Okay, listen. These, all these things are not a good sign. All these things have problems, right? Our terminal server um, is missing patches. Our wireless endpoint has default creds. Our firewall, gateway firewall um, is missing EDR, outdated firmware. So here's the reality, guys. This is why vulnerability management is its own thing. Yes, you can spend $40,000 and buy a Nessus scanner or a Rapid7 scanner or whatever, Put it in place and scan your network, and there you go. You got visibility. But you cannot say you have vulnerability management. All you've done is inform yourself on where your vulnerabilities are. Now is the actual work begins. You need to prioritize and get funding and take action on remediating the vulnerabilities in a prioritized from a criticality perspective action. And this is why it's usually a full-time uh, employee job to do vulnerability management. Now. We've got this, you know, skull here. This isn't good. Let's reboot the asset. This is going to take one of our resources. We have to send uh, Sally down to the uh, the plant to reboot this HMI field device. Big mistake by me. Um, let's see. We've got two people waiting to work. Let's go ahead and segment our network, okay? Segmenting our network is going to allow us to further protect the the, the uh, OT ICS network segment, which is very important to me right now. Or at least that's the, the approach I've been taking. So let's do this. We need to request budget too. Like we're almost out of money, guys. It's going to be more of a, um, a holiday um, dozen donuts than a holiday party this year if the budget stays what it is. Welcome to, welcome to OT. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So he asked, um, how do we avoid this in game? What, what specifically were you talking about, Kyle? Avoid what? Uh, also, someone asked, um, are there any stats like um, uh, on, on what each of these things gets you, like 20% prevention increase and things like that? Um, we're releasing the new version of the game guide tomorrow which, uh, or this week, um, which maybe not tomorrow, but this week, which does give you how much each in game, how much each buff gives you. Now that doesn't equate to real life necessarily just in the simulation, but yes, there isn't a, a guide that tells you what each thing gets you. Um, yeah. so yeah, Kyle, what's, oh, I'm sorry. That was, um, yeah. So then the other one Ethan. was, uh, Kyle was asking, um, 
you know, welcome to OT. Yes, exactly. Now, I'm assuming, Kyle, that you were talking about the fact that we just uh, DOSed our server. own PLC because we did a vulnerability scan. So keep in mind, when you do a vulnerability scan in real life against production systems, because of the active nature and the sensitive nature of a lot of control systems, you can knock over your own devices and cause disruptions in your production. Therefore, you need to implement safe in, in game, you need to implement safe or ICS safe testing procedures. What that equates to in real life is basically implementing pro processes and procedures so that you're doing more of a passive vulnerability scan, more hands on manual scans, testing in a uh, test and development environment, that sort of thing. Oops, I'm sorry. I just. No, no, that's good. He, he, he was echoing that, that spot on me, me dosing the HMI device, which just shows that, you know, my, my experience and background has been in healthcare, federal IT, the ICS space, uh, a little less, but that's why I'm doing the simulation, right? By doing the simulation, I'm, I'm actually learning instead of blowing up a real, <laughs> blowing up a real piece of operational technology. I do it in the safe confines of my environment. So guys, as much as I hate having to do it, I've only got two thousand dollars, right? You need to request things cost budget. money. Yep. So I'm going to put on my suit and tie, put on my my costume, and I'm going to walk over to the uh, board of advisors. It's going to take me three turns to walk across the plant, go up into the office building, go up the elevator, go into the glass room, and then wait my turn for my three minutes where I can ask for yeah, money. You're, pre you're preparing your presentation. You're preparing yep. your your analysis. So that's why it takes you three turns. Uh, that's totally spot on. All right, let's go. I will tell you, if we get declined for budget, which is a reality, it might it might stink. It might stink. Okay, so we've got zero people doing anything because we're still requesting budget and we're still segmenting our network. Guys, here's another fun fact. Network segmentation is a huge win. It's very hard. In my Pantheon, I've been asked to make a video for this for a while and I haven't done it yet. But I'll just kind of tease it right now. In the pantheon of like most high value controls, as far as like managing risk, two factor authentication is up there. Security awareness is up there. Network segmentation is up there. PAM is up there. Uh, okay, I'll just leave those, those four for now. PAM privileged access management is really hard to do well. Okay. Because people want, you know, I'm an IT guy. I know what I'm doing. Give me my access. Uh, when I make it, when I make you a local admin on your box, you don't call me anymore to help install software. So I don't need to deal with you. There you go. You get permissions. Pam's really hard to do. Network segmentation is also really hard to do. Okay. When you start the, the reason's the same guys, when you put something in place that breaks operations because they can't install software on the PAM side or they can't access the file server on the network side because of network access, people are likely to open things up and completely compromise the whole point of having the control in the first place. So it's very difficult to roll out, but it has huge value. We talk about east-west lateral movement, finding the crown jewels. With network segmentation, you greatly reduce the the, the likelihood that a threat actor is able to do that successfully. Security awareness, a little bit easier to do. Two-factor authentication, a little bit easier to do as well. So we're still putting our deck together. Uh, Clint, you know, the PowerPoint's looking good. I'm sending it over to the, to the engineering team to get their thoughts and feedback input. So we'll see, we'll see what they come back with. I think because we've done our vulnerability assessment and we have data to show them, we have a pretty good chance of getting approved for budget. That's a great point. That is a great point. And the game, you the do simulation does work that way, by the way. Yeah, it's a great point. Like if on day one you requested budget, I would hope that the game doesn't allow you to get budget because it's harder. It's more difficult. Yeah, no one. All right, we've got network segmentation. Nobody goes into their boss's office after filling out the I-9 paperwork, they're like, hey, I just want to introduce myself. Like, super excited to be here. By the way, I would love to money. request another 50 grand <laughs> of budget. <laughs> okay, so we've got network segmentation. You can see it's color-coded by our segments now. and We have firewalls in place, which is how you do it. We're feeling pretty good about ourselves. We've got two people. 
Still working on budget. So even though the money hasn't come in yet, let's see what we can do for our $2,000 in one turn. We can encrypt network traffic for $0, enforce strong passwords for $0, strong Wi-Fi for $0. I like $0. We can do all of these uh, default creds. Let's see where default creds are. We should probably, yeah, we should probably start looking at our process control network critical devices and start clearing up some of those vulnerabilities. Yeah. And this is an interesting time to pivot, right? Because you could make the argument, implement strong Wi-Fi, keep those threat actors that are able to get on-premise from, from you know, or who can't get on-premise from using like a Pringles can shotgun mic or shotgun antenna getting onto our property. Uh, enforce strong passwords is good, but let's go ahead and look at default creds. These are the worst. Anybody can Google default creds, okay? Anyone can Google that. So let's focus on our oil and gas area since that's where we want to be. Our field device, I feel like, is really out there and at risk. So let's do that one. And then let's change the default creds on either, the either PLC, the that AB797900. Yeah. So, Clint, um, educate me for a second here. What is this one and what is this one? Well, I didn't see where you're pointing. What what is this AB seventy nine hundred asset and what is this Palo Alto field asset? Yeah, so that's a switch. So and that and, and in real life that that probably and it just that's just a name that was randomly generated. In real life, if you have an industrial switch out there, it's probably going to be something more like a Schweitzer or a Moxa, um, you know, as a or you okay. know a Phoenix contact or something as opposed to uh, Palo Alto. But anyway, that's a switch. So the top one is a switch. The bottom one is a PLC. Okay, and it also nope. just FYI. Anyway, we'll get into that later. If we have any OT buffs out there that say, you don't just change your credentials on a PLC like that, I'll discuss that later. Okay. So this is just a network switch is a network switch, right? Like th this yeah. is IT, okay? So this is the OT that we need to worry about. And the PLC is what? Controlling how much the, the plant is... Uh, like what temperature it's at or yeah that's controlling your process that's that's i mean that's the thing that controls the process so you want to secure your plcs as much as possible right off the bat and anything that has access to those plcs yeah and i want to share a true story so i worked in manufacturing right which has a little bit of ot dude if you we had a system that would vent well, it basically was responsible, like the manufacturing process would create this acidic, dangerous, toxic air, and it would go through several layers of filtration and then release into the into the air, right through the smokestack thing. Pretty standard. But that is controlled through a PLC. Like the PLC tells you if the filters are dirty, uh, how much, uh, what, what the concentration of different elements and particles are in the, the gas in case you need to adjust it and stuff like that. So very serious stuff that's being controlled here. Okay, Clint, we got budget. Let's go. We're going to Vegas. Told you. All right. So we mitigated our vulnerability. We got Very a forty thousand nice. dollar increase. That's pretty good. I like it, guys. So <clears throat> what do we do? Do we invest it intelligently, or do we we put it on red and try to double our money? <laughs> do we invest it intelligently? No. Let's just buy some stupid stuff. <laughs> yeah. Let's see what the current uh, vendor is saying over at Black Hat. All right. So. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Kyle Peters spent two seconds on Google, got Phoenix contract, uh, contact router defaults. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle, for confirming our concern. <laughs> okay. So let, let us continue hardening our systems. Let's do some system hardening. Um, HMI PCS. Um, hold on one second. Let me see if there's still default creds because that's really the grossest thing. You can just click on the asset itself to see if. Uh, I mean, no, can, I know, you... but I wanted to see. Like for me, default creds is really gross. So I want to see. I want to do the risk analysis on how bad should I do this. Yeah, and that's a good point. When you're in game, you can click on each individual asset to see what can be done on an asset. But if you want to do like what Jerry's doing and say, I want to see what all has default credentials, then you can click change default credentials, and then the green targets show you what devices need to have those changed. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this is just a switch, which I'm a little less concerned about now um, because you'd have to get on our network and then be able to get into it. This DMZ wireless is a little concerning with default cred since technically you could just get get to it without being physically on site. So I'm going to 
Um, change the default creds on that. I've got two people. Let's do this. Um, safe testing seconds. methods, right? Safe testing methods, right? This is how you can scan ICS equipment without breaking it. Yeah, and yeah. So that's gonna let you do a vulnerability scan without breaking it, and then the ICS vendor certification lets you patch process control okay, devices okay. and systems without breaking well, I'm gonna, it. I'm going to do both of those because I have played this game several times. The oil and gas refinery, which is not my strength, and I typically um, light the plant on fire. So I would not want to do that this time around. You know, Nicholas brings up a good point. It's going too well for our sock. Where are the hackers? That's making me nervous too because number one, oops, sorry. Um, number one, yeah, we don't really know what's going on because we don't have a lot of visibility other than one network sensor in one network segment. And we don't have a lot of, uh, see, there you go. Loiter, I, that's what I thought. If we don't have activity going on in our networks, they're probably going physical on site. And that's what's happening there. Thank goodness for the uh, the uh, video, video surveillance. Yep. And I've said it before on stream, if you watch me play this game, in real life, this video surveillance system cost $10,000 and it was a real expensive line item that really didn't, I was not happy as a CISO investing in. But the first time you catch someone on, on premise, the first time the control delivers on its value prop, you're like so thrilled that you have it. So uh, I'm changing my mind. I'm going to go update my Yelp review for that company. <laughs> this should also be a warning. We know they're on site, which means they could have been dropping USB devices now, malicious USB TV devices in the perimeter. So we need to make sure our USB device security is up to date on our critical assets. Okay. So when you say the, like, so here's one thing that I'm a little confused. The green, the purple, the red, the orange, those are all my facility, right? And the brown mm -hmm. is, is remote facility. The brown is out in the process environment. So okay. basically stuff that's most likely not in a building. And if you don't, if you don't count a plant as a building, not corporate, put it that way. Okay. There's no actions here, which is confusing because the, I don't know why, maybe I don't know why, but because I can't patch it because I don't have the ability to do it yet. Uh, look at the vulnerabilities there. What's on there? Weak password. Yeah. Because a week, uh, the only way to, 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 correct weak passwords in this game is to enforce strong password policy. Um, that's a policy wide oh. change as opposed to a device wide change. And you're not going to be able to do anything with the strong password on the, the PLC itself right there. I mean, well, anyway, it's okay. I'm going to deploy USB security. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to harden my engineer workstation, right? Cause the engineer workstation is kind of the, the control center for all the PLCs and, and SCADA stuff, right? Yeah, that's going to be your control room, mostly for SCADA, and you might have some test and development environment in there and stuff like that. All right, well, let's deploy USB security on it. Okay, let's end this. At this point, because we don't know whether or not a box got popped due to a USB or something like that when we didn't have protection on it, at this point, I'm starting to wonder if they're in there right now. So we don't necessarily... We, we can either... At this point, we can either deploy some endpoint protection, which is host-based intrusion detection, to see um, if we've been compromised. But we could also um, start just doing some threat hunting to see if we're compromised. So you can always do threat hunting on individual assets, too, to see if you've been compromised. I know. The the, the analysis paralysis that I deal with as a um, CISO and as an end user in this is like, it seems like you know, doing threat hunting on one device out of, you know, 25 or 30 or out of an entire enterprise is like kind of a, a roll of the dice versus rolling out, you know, um, two factor authentication or something like that, where, you know, you're getting a value for an enterprise, um, you know. All right. So we, we've done vendor patch certification, um, which means we can now patch those OT devices without uh, bricking them. And we can test them to find out. So I intelligently chose both of these at the same time because to me, if if you get one, it's useless. You need both uh, for it to have value for you. We've also implemented USB security on the engineer workstation. There we go. There you go. That's a good question for you, Clint. Yeah, so 
um, in the game, first of all, your advanced security training for the staff does not affect things like USB security or social engineering. That's going to allow you to do things further in the game, like do a vulnerability assessments without having to hire a contractor and things like that. Um, so you can spend resources instead of money. Oh, my bad. That's sorry. That's that's 1.8, not 1.7. Um, but so that's going to allow you to do things like uh, crack ransomware encryption keys and stuff like that. But social engineering, or I'm sorry, um, user awareness training provides a huge boost to defense against malicious USB. And then once if you have both user awareness training and secured USB or USB security, it becomes darn near impossible for a malicious USB to hit that asset. Interesting. All right. Well, what's this right here? Vendor certification says, can I click this? We're at top, the top the new, um, new graphic. I, I don't think you can click that. That's just letting you know that you have your, your, you just, that just lets you know that you have your, okay. Do your vendor, do your, your patch certification from the vendor. I think that's active for 10 turns. And then that allows you to actually patch your OT devices without well, detriment. Yeah. Let's strike while the iron's hot and patch our stuff. All right. Yes. Okay, guys. So we patched the engineering workstation and um, these two, uh, well, this PLC and this HMI. What's the HMI's function, Clint? The human machine interface is a is a computer terminal that sits in the control room that allows control room operators to view and control plant and process functionality. So it's if the HMI is compromised, that means whoever compromised it can see what's going on in the plant and possibly control that. This is a good okay. question here. Somebody just asked, what's the 1% health up there at top? That is your threat intelligence score. And so every single time that we detect an intruder or do something that gives us a little bit of threat intelligence, that increases our threat intelligence score, which is a win condition in the game. When the threat intelligence score reaches 100%, then the red team operation is shut down and you win the game. But there are other things. So if you are compromised, you can do things like gather forensics evidence to increase your threat intelligence score. Yeah, thanks for the questions, Nicholas. Appreciate it. System patched. Nice job, guys. Okay. So this PLC is good, except it still has weak passwords. So, guys, I think we need to investigate strong passwords. It's one resource. It's one turn. It'll be able to continue to harden our, our OT. Uh, so I think it's valuable. Clint, question from a process perspective. If we don't create IR procedures, can we still activate an IR and just yeah, be like you can. less effective? Creating the procedures just makes your IR, uh, your incident response more effective. Yep. Got you. All right. Let's enforce strong passwords. We're still going to have two, two assets, two human resources and 41 grand. So to, uh, to Christopher Word's uh, point, we are going to put some aside for the holiday party. Don't worry about that. It's going to be top shelf liquor this year, okay? But we still have, <laughs> we still have. It's only March. We still got a couple months. We got to protect the organization. Uh, so let let's continue to see what we can do with these two resources. Um, holiday party distractions are an actual inject during the uh, for the the IR tabletop uh, version of this game. That's awesome. Let's let's continue to patch uh, these devices. And let's so uh, Clint, I'm considering endpoint security or USB security on the PCS recorder. What is the value of a PCS recorder? <laughs> that's weird. That's a weird host name. That's the that's the a uh, the historian. The historian records data and information transactions from the process. So this is probably not a transactional historian because I developed it and I know that. Um, but so nothing can be controlled if, if the historian is compromised, but that gives the attacker visibility into the process control network. Yeah. And it looks like um, Nazmul Hassan 
it works in the space. You know, he says if HMI compromises all are compromised, then he went on further to say um, ICSOT need to be patched and updated. So yeah, I mean, this is consistent with our strategy that we've approached for this particular version of the simulation of, of focusing on that. Christopher Word making a compelling case to leadership on why we need to uh, request budget for a bigger holiday party. I'm thinking cruise around the harbor, Clint. Okay. That's always a great idea to get your cybersecurity budget for your cybersecurity and then embezzle it for like yachts and things like that <laughs> for the holiday party, even Super if it's yacht. the rest of the team, you know, it's morale, I'm, you know. All right. Well, we've got, we've got a couple of seconds here before the end of it. Let's look at this NIDS. I'm assuming this is our, uh, uh, like a network uh, intrusion detection system. Yeah, if those get knocked out or denied, then of course um, you have, you don't have visibility. Ooh, hold on. I'm going to change the default creds on. That was a quick crash decision, but default creds on the switch, probably not super important, but default creds is nauseating to me. All right, guys, we still got 41 grand. Let's go. Good news. Okay. Good. All right. So another day, another day, another no compromise. That we know Deep. of. Oh, uh, I know it's tough to prove, disprove a negative password policy created and social engineering attacks are down. What did I do to, pr to do this? Maximum um, attack so against social milestones or rewards that you get for doing some proper procedures, proper things in order. Oh, so see. you put all the proper stuff in place to prevent, to prevent social, uh, social engineering attacks. Okay. That sounds good. So okay. yeah, right now we're so, at the strongest social engineering posture that we can be. Okay, well, that's perfect. So that'll adjust our our thinking as we move forward with um with with controls. Now I I like updating firmware. Typically, this is reserved for OTICS type stuff or network appliances. Endpoints don't typically get the firmware update. This is a server router over here. I don't think I want to. I don't want to spend the time on it, honestly. Someone who's getting in here at this point isn't updating the firmware. They're going to be moving laterally. So that's not, there's no real value right now to me for that. ICS monitoring. You can click on the question mark to find out what this actually means, right? And it provides visibility into compromised ICS, ICS assets. So if I click this, it sounds like if we do have a compromise, we will be made aware of it. So I'm going to go with it. It's two people. It's eight thousand dollars. It's a good value. Let's do it. You bring up a good point, Jerry, and that when you have a limited budget, doing your risk assessment. In this case, we're just when there's no in-game risk assessment. We are doing our risk assessment in you know manually um, as we think about things. And you have a lot of vulnerabilities, and there's a lot of things to worry about. But you have to figure out where you're going to spend your critical resources. And just as Jerry pointed out, you know. Fixing the router in the server network may not be important right now as fixing all of our critical process equipment. Yeah. And I know it sounds weird to say like, oh, default creds on this or whatever, like not a priority because it sounds like you don't care. But but there's, <laughs> you know, not everything is the top criticality because if everything's the most important, then nothing is important, right? So you have to make those hard decisions. Again, this is why CISOs uh, get paid a lot why they have gray hair and why they have a short shelf life, 18 to 24 months on average. It's, it's a high stress job and thankless. Also, I might add from, you know, in my opinion. Okay. So we've got one person left. We've got 30 seconds. We got 33 G's. Let's, let's look at hardening stuff. we got the engineer workstation install antivirus. We do have EDR on it already, so I think we're good, but I want to do threat hunting. I want to see if we got compromised here, okay? I feel like we don't, but let me look. Here we go. Let's see. Clint, don't know if you remember, but been a long time since you held that class in Sugar Hill, but this was my first official OTICS training, and it was awesome. Thanks, Wesley. I think it was Sugar Land, um, but yeah... Nope, I remember, and uh, like, this, yeah, I remember this was when we were doing early runs of uh, the Red versus Blue platform in conjunction with our OT cybersecurity class that we held. Thanks for attending, and 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 thanks for your comments there. 
Absolutely. And um, Nazmul is asking about the pipeline valve. I think that that particular space, these are not, they're, they're not active elements of the environment. It's the controls of the pipelines that we focus on. Right, Clint? Say that again. The pipeline vi valve elements in our environment, we don't touch them. Yeah, yeah, control, yeah. They're That's just devices. Yeah, those are just there to let you know if the process has been damaged or not. And and yeah, we can't actively do anything to the physical. That's that's our field engineers uh, putting in safety systems and whatnot. We, as the cybersecurity team, aren't going to deal with that. Great, great example. Christopher Word with a real-life war story um, talking about working at a toll facility and shutting down 83 automated toll collection buildings. That is a significant impact to operations. And it happened by triggering critical alarms through the SCADA sensors. So that sounds like I was working there, Christopher, because I've played this game several times and I always knock over the SCADA stuff because I'm reckless with my scanners. So it's interesting. I do want to tease out, Christopher, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn if we're not. I think we are. Um, Clint and I are musing about having, we're doing the Let's Play live streams like this. But we're also musing about having a weekly kind of war stories stream, just industry professionals talking to other industry professionals about <laughs> the reality of what our, our job, our world really is, and, and some of those lessons learned. So connect to me if you want to share that story or others as we get stood up with the, that um, content idea. You know, that, that but, anecdote right there, not that it's anecdotal, it's fact, I guess. But uh, anyway, that story just illustrates what we're doing here in, in terms of the vulnerability scan without proper procedures. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Clint, can you speak to, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Lee's comment here, Dr. Monshines. So he asked, I searched the threat gen website and was wondering if I missed a link to uh, a community chat resource. Um, so we have uh, our discord server, and there is a Discord link where you can communicate and chat with not only about the game, but there is a real cybersecurity chat um, in there as well. Is that what you're referring to? Possibly. And I know we're we're just um, uh, Dr. Monshine. I, I don't know if you're using Discord or not, but it's like a it's like a chat. Um, it's like community forum type thing. Kind of think of back in the day when we had like uh, BB uh, not BBSs, but like you know forums. Um, that's kind of what it is. We're, we're actively building it out right now. There's been some discussion around, do we just make the invite open to the public or do you have to be invite only? Uh, but if you, <clears throat> excuse me, mes message me on LinkedIn, Dr. Munchen, I can get you a link to the uh, Discord server just so you can get stood up on there and check it out. The portal, our education portal also has a, an, a community as well, where you can discuss information like this within the um, the members of the Red versus Blue community. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we've got ICS security monitoring. Guys, fingers crossed, because this is supposed to tell us if we have compromised assets in our environment. Let's hope for not, okay? But let's also be, you know, wearing our brown pants to work today, okay? Let's, let's go that route. Okay, security monitor and ICS specific threat mining have been implemented. Let's see. Uh, okay. Click on the PLC real quick. I want to see something. Yeah, so <clears throat> so it, it, it does appear, yeah, because there, there's nothing further you can do, which means we have our ICS monitoring enabled. It currently at least does appear that nothing in our process environment is compromised. Now, we don't know that for a fact because they could be using stealth techniques but that's the way it looks. We can do threat hunting on devices to do a, a deeper inspection if we just really have this weird feeling that we might be compromised. Okay. Well, here's what I would say as the CISO of this company. I now feel that I have, depending on what this engineering workstation looks like, okay. I feel that I have got the OT section of my network in a place that I'm comfortable with. It could be better, but I'm comfortable. And now I have been neglecting, literally like go gross negligence, the rest of my environment. And I want to go over here and look at some low hanging fruit and make sure that I'm doing 
the proper due care for my entire environment that I'm responsible for managing. Again, I feel like the OTICS stuff is at a level that I have a risk tolerance for. My appetite for risk is met with this. Now my risk appetite is is blown out over here and I need to address it. So that's what I'm going to do. Clint, I'm going to move forward with this decision, but do you have any thoughts about that strategy? If it was me personally, I would look at those vulnerabilities that are currently on the engineering workstation, the HMI, and the SCADA server. I would look at those first to see what's there um, and take care of those first. Like, look at the actual vulnerabilities. Click on the vulnerability shield on each of those. So that's, you know, so you've got some vulnerabilities there. Those are all vulnerabilities that add to the attack surface. Should the adversary get it, gain access to that area? Now, now here's an important thing to, to look at. 15 you seconds. Know, if you restrict access to that area, we've got our social engineering pretty good. We've got our USB security pretty good, provided you've put USB security on everything. Okay, hold on. I've got six seconds and three resources. I've got to do this. Hold on. Okay. Okay, damn it. All right. Did, okay. it, did those, see if those actually went through. Look at your... Uh, um... Two of them did. One of them did not. Unfortunately. Okay, finish your thought. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, if you have your perimeter and, and your and your low-hanging fruit, so your if you have your access vectors shored up around those assets, then maybe securing the vulnerabilities on each asset individually may not be important. So just there's something to think about. You don't have to fix every vulnerability in every device. If you fix the access vectors to those devices. Yep. Zero trust architecture. So I, I hear you. I did spend some time and resources over here. I'm thinking I, I really, I, I don't know. It just makes me think that like, I can just rip and replace my entire corporate environment as long as I'm continuing to pump oil and gas out. Yeah, no problem, uh, Darcel. Um, let me see what that link is. There you go. There you go, Darcel. All right. So because Clint's here, I'll follow his guidance. But if it was just me, I'd be I'd be helping my corporate brethren. Just like like look at this. Endpoint security on our firewall. I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I, I need to. I need to know, Clint. This is yeah. Of course, I would have done that early on too, because that's a perimeter to your whole company. Yeah. Okay. So let me. What what can I do here? System hardening. Okay. Let's do that. All right. Okay. So we're still hardening our HMI, which is fine. Like I don't want action, but I'm I'm happy. I'm happy that we're we're moving forward. There we go. Another loiterer caught. Get off my lawn. Okay, we see it went up two percent. Now, Clint, question: Do I have to have a hundred loiterers caught to get to a hundred percent? If that is your only sole means of threat intelligence. Um, every time you do anything that catches someone, whether it's on site physically mm. in your cyber environment, whether you do threat hunting, anytime you discover anything, it increases your threat intelligence score at different variables based on the value of how you gathered it. I see. Okay. Well, let's, let's harden the firewall since now we're talking about detecting lateral movement. So we'll do that and we'll do this again strengthening our OTICS environment. Okay. Anytime there isn't the a pop-up. I'm trying oh, to Discord find the Discord link. link. Yeah. Do, do you have it or do you want me to get it? I have it somewhere. I'll, I'll get it. You you do what you're doing there and I'll get it. Okay. That sounds good. It wasn't where I left it. <laughs> okay. So let's see what we're doing on the action line. We've got our three people. You know, things have been kind of slow. I feel good about it. Holy crumb. New staff's 45000 Even when we got new budget, we didn't have $45,000. Dude, okay. I have a question or a feature request, Clint. <laughs> Listen, 
hiring new FTEs is hard and you usually have to make a, a, a beg to the business and get all this stuff. Whereas hiring professional services, businesses will stroke a check. Can we have higher new staff and higher professional services and the professional services resource disappears after like five turns or 10 turns or something that costs less money? Well, you know, we do have the, the roadmap meeting this afternoon. We can discuss that with the developers. <laughs> I just, I feel like it's a, it's a reasonable option, right? You can have, you know, a full staff for the whole game, or you could pay a little less, but then it's a, it's, it's a expiring resource. Yeah. We, we, we do have options for that in the next rollout 1.8, um, okay. in, in different ways, which, um, when we do our next live stream for 1.8, we can, we'll, we can explain how it works. Okay, cool. All right. So. Let's do this. We're going to install endpoint on this firewall. So that should give us the, uh, the visibility that we need uh, for lateral movement. Okay. We're going to install ooh, endpoint security or system hardening on this IDS. We really, here, I'm going to install endpoint security so we can detect problems. And endpoint security there. Okay. I think I've, I'm dropping it so we've got all the visibility. Yeah, exactly. Christopher Word knows what's going on. We could even have an option for apprentice, right? Or a, a summer intern, good for six turns. Yep. By the way, um, there's the Discord link for anybody. Um, there, is an, uh, there is an option for real-world cybersecurity chat in our Discord, and also just chatting about the simulation, people playing the simulation. Oh, you went mute. No, I know I went mute. I was oh. I was uh, talking off stream. Um, oh. Okay, so we've got our three people still. Nothing's pending. Everything's completed. We are looking good. Um, still got twenty six turns. All right. So again, I feel well. We can patch this guy. We can harden this guy. We can patch this one. All right. So let's continue to harden that environment even though it goes against what I, I was all about. Let's see. Oh, install AV or harden the system. Let's harden the system. Okay, guys, that's our three. That's our three people's actions. We've got, at this point, our staff are more OTICS people uh, forged in the fires of oil and gas than they are corporate IT infosec people. Awesome. Every turn that goes by that we don't get a pop-up makes me makes me feel good. I am having a little anxiety about the potentials though, but all right, so we can update AV, deploy USB security, install AV, or let's go look over here. Let's look at our environment, guys. Default creds on the router and the corporate router. Uh well, backups would be good. VPN. Okay, so here's a couple things, guys. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I'm thinking. We are well into our tenure at our information security job. We haven't had any problems yet except a couple loiterers. So we know that we're being targeted by some adversary or adversaries. We have some great technical solutions in place, but... As we talked about the NIST cybersecurity framework earlier, early on, you want to get left of boom, right? Identify, protect. You want to put good things in place. But bad stuff happens. Right of boom is how we deal with that, right? We detect, then we respond, then we recover back to a known good state. Right now, I feel like our detection is good. But we haven't had to deal with response yet. And I'm starting to be worried that we're getting in the area where like, it could happen. Right. And how are we going to respond? And is it going to be useful? So I'm going to go ahead and create IR procedures to strengthen our incident response capability. Because as I'm thinking, and this happens in real life, you're typically your identify and protect get built up really well. Your detection goes next as far as like getting well and then respond and recovery. You're kind of left like, oh, like we'll just handle it when it comes. And unfortunately, you don't want to find out what your response capability is when you're dealing with an active incident. That is the worst time to find out how good it is. So let's go ahead and do that. Clint, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm nervous about 
why we're not seeing any compromises anywhere. I think we're mm-hmm. either extremely lucky or they're there and we're not seeing it. Um, I think we did a better job of shoring up things in the beginning than you did in the past. But yeah, we need to start preparing for incident response just in case. I would say get your incident response procedure shored up. Then let's start increasing yep. our monitoring. Yep. A hundred percent with you. Um, let's see. How would we monitor? Um, I see us monitoring fine. This is fine. This is fine. I don't know if we can do any more for monitoring, honestly. Do you, do you, so you, you, do you have, I, okay, monitor, you have IR procedures, you put that in place. Monitoring, just did it. you just need to start putting out um, endpoint um, visibility, which is your endpoint oh, protection. See. Yeah, just start putting out endpoint, start, in, start with endpoint protection on your most critical devices first. That will let you know when things get compromised. Now, keep in mind, they can always deploy stealth that yep. makes it hard to see. All right. Well, this this is our terminal server that is grossly at risk. So let's do it. Okay. Ooh, got it in just in time. Yes. Uh, Kyle, if you come back and watch on replay, thanks for being with us. He had to run off to a meeting. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Yep. Okay, so we've got two turns. We're creating IR procedures. Let's continue to implement um, the type of stuff that will help us get visibility Antivirus would be part of that, right, Clint? Helping us. Antivirus a... doesn't help your visibility in game. Um, okay. It helps prevent things like malware and ransomware if you have the right signatures, of course, if it's updated. Um, but yep. things that are going to increase your visibility is obviously putting your network sensors in the proper segments, as yep. well as putting in your host based detection, which is your endpoint protection on your individual assets. Okay. So let's look at our DC. Let's install endpoint security. Again, I like helping the corporate side now that I feel that I've raised the level of security of my ICSOT segment. So I'm going to add endpoint security over here. Our SIM, I'm going to install endpoint security because if our SIM gets taken out, guys, we have no visibility. Okay. Yep. Let's keep rolling. How's my volume, everybody? Does this sound comparable? Is this, since this is kind of a dry run, is my volume comparable to Jerry's? I think it looks okay in their meter. Yeah, it sounds good to me, okay. um, Clint, but I can't hear myself either, but that's okay. <laughs> Actually, I do have my monitor feeding back. I just get used to it. Okay, guys, another day, another dollar. 29 days in of our 50-day uh, engagement, and we're, we're, um, we're sitting pretty. We're looking pretty good. Let's get this email secure server fixed up, because by the way, guys, thank you. Agonize, Ag- Agonize, and Christopher. Guys, a lot of people don't think of um, email as a mi- as a business mission critical asset or resource, and it absolutely is. Next time you do a tabletop, don't let use anyone use the gal. Don't let anyone use their Outlook. See, let's see how um, what kind of issues they run into. Because if you don't like, I don't. I don't know a lot of people's phone numbers because they're in my phone, right? Yeah. I don't know a lot of people's emails because they're in my <clears throat> Outlook. Gone are the days where we memorize phone numbers. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we've got one person, uh, and we're going to continue to deploy endpoint security. Although, I will say, I feel like our... Um... Oh, change default creds. Okay, so and I'm going to this... install endpoint... FYI, we're going to run over our hour that we had allotted. I have time to stay here. I think Jerry does. Um, if we want to run over, we're only about halfway through this scenario. Yeah. Well, and we've been, it doesn't always take this long, but we've, we're stopping. We're talking through our risk analysis. We're uh, engaging chat and stuff. So um, I have a, yeah, I have a two o'clock. So we're good. Let's see. Oh, good. Um, Ayrton Chris Montego Montenegro has been playing uh, Red Gen, uh, Threat Gen Red versus Blue and been enjoying it. So, really happy to hear that. Cool. Glad you're enjoying it. Thanks for sharing. Yep. We're going to be setting up the ability for head to heads and uh, streaming on that and stuff like that. So, look forward to that. Although, no stream sniping. Okay. That would be, that would be unfair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just FYI, everybody, if you're playing the Steam version, um, 
keep uh, we do have a discount right now going uh it's on our website if you want to sign up for the pro version and uh 1.8 uh drops tomorrow uh, we're still in early access on our portal so that mm -hmm. there's, there's a discount there and keep an eye out on our live streams as well as jerry's simply cyber stream uh where he'll be dropping discounts and uh free access coupon or um, raffles and things like raffles. that. raffles yeah actually i might raffle off one on this thursday simply cyber live live stream at 4 30 p.m eastern standard time so st look for that all right we got our ir procedures so that's good now from a perspective of the game i i don't need to uh refine any level of skill within my incident response, right? Like I have a sec ops team now. Right. Say that again. I, I now have written IR procedures, but it's not a skill tree where I, I like have to learn uh, Correct. mobile forensics yeah. or, okay. Yeah, no. Okay. So let's keep going. I'm feeling pretty good guys. I feel like our, you know what, to be honest, I'm talking about identify, protect, detect, respond. If I'm being true to my word, recover is the next one that we should shore up. So I am going to spend the money on backups because honestly, I really should be uh, thorough. Before I do that really quick though, Clint, does security skills training refine my incident response capability? No, not in this version of the game. Okay. And well, then I'm going to do know backups. What? I might be wrong. It might provide a buff to your incident response. Mainly what it does, it gives you the ability to crack ransomware key and do some more, more advanced things if you need to. Okay. Can you talk to, I'm going to choose um, system backups. And we have a question from chat from a LinkedIn user, uh, Clint, if you want to pull it up. So regarding uh, network traffic encryption uh, option in game, is traffic now unencrypted plain data or setting encryption on um, adds a better encryption option. So what that does is when you implement network encryption in game, and I know in real life implementing network encryption is the device level and it's a lot more complex, but what it does in game is that it prevents leaking password information. Um, so it prevents password attacks from being um, easier to the red team and it's also going to, I believe, and I'm not, I don't remember this. It may also prevent um, data exfiltration. I'll, I'll have to get back with you on that, or, and it's something we'll look into. Um, I'm not, I don't develop or every, I don't develop every aspect of the game. So some of the aspects like that, I forgot the exact mechanics. Um, but for example, if you have a strong password policy implemented, but yet someone sniffs your network and gets credentials, then it kind of negates the strong password policy because they've gotten your credentials anyway and um, and crack those. I think I think that's how that works. And forgive me for you know I know I'm the lead developer, but I actually it's, it's a complex backend. I don't know every single detail. Perfect. So as you were answering that, uh, time expired. I had a couple resources that I needed to uh, use, so I. I strengthen the Wi-Fi just as a best practice. We're getting into the phase where like I can take care of the nice to haves instead of the absolute criticals. I also continue to do my backups and then I updated the antivirus on my HMI. Okay. Let's right. go ahead and look at our stuff. This terminal server definitely needs to be patched and hardened because this is an external facing uh, resource. Okay. Cost zero dollars, so we're not going to need to ask for more budget. Let's keep going. All right, we got our backups, guys. So now we've got the entire net, uh, NIST cybersecurity framework uh, at least implemented in some capacity. Okay, good. So now let's look at our, our situation. We can do really nice things, right? We can do VPN for 5000 we can encrypt that network traffic, which would be nice. SDLC, although I wouldn't really think of SDLC, application vulnerabilities improves defense against command injections. Yeah. Okay, so SDLC looks like it's gonna address a lot of vulnerabilities, like a lot. Um, so there's a lot of value. Instead of 
instead of hold on instead it of fixing fix them but it helps it helps buff your defense against them okay well i still i'm still an advocate of the high value controls okay so i'm going to do this for 5000 unless i can think of something else to do like everything's pretty good. Like I'm feeling really good about where we are. We could do electronic locks, but we've we've already caught two loiterers on our property, so I feel like our physical security is pretty good. Okay, false sense of hope, right, Clint? <laughs> it's the the thirty guys that have come on prem, then we only caught two. So, all right, let me end the turn. I'm yeah, I'm really worried about the fact that oh, there you go. There's a compromise. What? Okay. Okay. Compromised asset detected. Hey, I just want to thank um, me for making the focus go from ICSOT over to the corporate infrastructure, <laughs> not being the most negligent four turns ago. Congratulations, CISO. I will say, right. though, that compromising that email server doesn't have a direct uh, benefit to protecting the the ICS network and systems. However, if you do, now that the email server is compromised, now they have credentials. So that could end up leading into a, an easier password or credential compromise in the ICS network. So to Jerry's point, that's why it's important not to just focus on one area. You do have to focus on critical assets throughout your network and understand that there are critical assets in your enterprise network that can end up possibly leading to an attack surface or an easier compromise in your ICS network. Okay. Now from a game perspective, I want to point this out. I need to activate IR now. And by the way, th again, thank you to the CISO from two turns ago for creating IR procedures, having the forethought that a compromise may happen. I still have one resource that costs zero resources to activate IR. It takes a turn. So I'm going to do one one thing just so I can put my analyst to work while I launch IR. Let's see. Um, our endpoints. So we're having an issue in this area. So we should probably tighten up this area. I'm going to I'm going to patch the DC. That seems like a really good idea. And then let's activate IR. Oops. OK, IR is activated. Let's go, guys. By the way, if you're on chat right now and you've ever done SecOps work, once you get an alert like this, the game is afoot. Very high adrenaline dump. Let's go, Clint. I'm ready. IR is activated. And when you're playing the game, it, the music changes. And if you go to like your, uh, you can go to your view mode. It shows like the mm -hmm. IR with the red screen and all that. Cool. Yes. There, there we are. This is us. You know, when okay. you're when you're playing this with the music, you hear the music change and it's like dun 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 dun. <laughs> All right. So now that we have access to our IR functions, right? Let's figure out what we're gonna do. And I haven't done this too much, so let me work through this in real time with you guys. Clean the asset, which I assume means um you know, like quarantine the malware, run a scan, say it says it's clean. You don't like basically over rebuild the machine from scratch gather forensics to see what happened maybe you could develop uh, iocs to see if it's elsewhere in your environment replace the asset you're guaranteed to get get it clean the way it got compromised might still exist but and then disconnect upstream connection i'm not entirely sure what this means does this mean from the internet and c2 services clint or does this mean like my organization doesn't have email anymore so disconnecting yeah so Number one, in real life, you would mean you don't have email. Um, that doesn't have any effect in game right now, but what as far as email goes, but disconnecting from the upstream connection is going to cut any remote C2 or any remote connection that the adversary has to that and prevents okay. lateral movement. Okay, so here's what I would do. I'm going to disconnect from upstream connection because this is the very first thing I want to do. This isn't an endpoint, right? Like if it was, it was Clint's workstation, just replace it. I, I don't have time to deal with him. I need I need to focus on bigger fish. This is my email server. This is a hot problem. Okay, so I'm going to disconnect the upstream connection. I do want to gather forensics if I can on the next turn um, and figure out how bad it is, but we do need to get it uh, back in production. Okay, let's end the turn. Let's 
Let's go. Here we go. Okay. Upstream connection has been done. So now they are not able to connect, no persistence, anything like that. I'm going to gather forensics on it and then replace the asset. There's a slight visual bug there that's fixed in 1.8. The network connection should have turned gray, which it didn't, but that's okay. Okay, it would be this one right here? Yeah. Okay, so the only reason you would ever disconnect this from upstream connection is if you were going to take forensics on it. If your plan was to replace the asset next turn, you wasted your time disconnecting it, okay? Because you're, you're, effectively, you're effectively going to disconnect it upstream by taking it offline anyways. Okay, so... It takes two turns to, to. Uh, it takes two How did turns to get you see fail. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe because I have IR oh, enabled right now. Because you started that and then you went into IR mode. I think before it was yep. finished. Yep. Okay. Couldn't have planned for that. All right. So what else can we do here? Um, I'm gonna clean the asset. Okay. Normally, normally I would do. I would do forensics and then I would replace the asset. But because replacing the asset would finish before the forensics happens, my concern from the game simulation perspective is that it would screw up my forensics capture. So I'm going to do the clean the asset and hope that the, <laughs> and hope that the forensics resolves before the clean asset uh, turn resolves. Yeah, it should, it should be a proper stack to where I'm, it should give you your threat intelligence points before it's cleaned. Okay, cool. Now, we can also do threat hunting on some of these things too while we're here. So because this is compromised, I have concern that, you know, threat actor moved into my DC. So let's do threat hunting on that as well. The difference between threat hunting is some people say, well, you can just install endpoint protection for the same as you can threat hunting. The difference is threat hunting doesn't cost you money, whereas endpoint protection does. Yes. And threat hunting typically involves human analysis, whereas EDRs are good, but they make mistakes. Yeah. Okay. So we are. Oh, okay. Oh, gather forensics is not done yet. And clean. Okay. Yeah, it takes two turns. It takes two turns. Um, it doesn't mention anything about my threat hunting. Oh, good. Threat ending on the DC succeeded, didn't find anything. Let's continue to look. This is our um, Blue Mirror server. I don't know. Oh, it's our sim. Let's look at the threat hunting on the <laughs> sim too. Make, make sure we're not compromised there. That's an unintentional um, vendor brand plug. I guess so is Palo Alto and all that stuff. Yeah. Kevron. <laughs> We got to, yeah, I, I think maybe, we, so we actually own the domain Victim Corp. Oh, okay. Oh, crap. I hope this stacked correctly. It did. Okay, good. Forensics evidence collected. Good. Threat intelligence score is increased. Very good. Look at this, 22% people. We could do this. Okay, so this is fine. Now, let me ask you this. Is it worth doing threat hunting on the asset we just cleaned to see if there's, um, it didn't address the full issue. It just addressed the symptoms. You, I, I would say in game, it, you're, if it looks cleaned right now, one turn after, it's probably not mm -hmm. worth doing threat hunting. Also, I want to point out, notice your profit loss meter is ever so slightly lower now um, due to the fact that and you can't see what the percentage, but you can see it's ever so slightly because your email server is offline. So you are the e uh, profit and loss also equates to production. So basically, it means part of your ability to do business is affected. That's why that meter has gone down a little bit. Okay, now this is another uh, question of game mechanic. So I need to reconnect my email server. So I'm going to do that. It takes one person, one turn. Which is kind of ridiculous, to... but we're we're limited by game mechanics. No, it's fine. I need to deactivate the IR, which is going to take a turn and take zero people. So I'd like to do that. And then because I'm still in the IR mode, I wanted to spend my human resources doing something. So let's do this. 
And then keep in mind that anything that you do IR mode has to take less than one turn. If you're also going to deactivate, I think that's where you're going with this. If it takes yep. two turns and you deactivate IR mode, it'll just cancel out that action that took more than one turn. Exactly. So I'm going to do threat hunting on my share server and threat hunting on my uh, router here. And the idea for me is that I'm basically looking at all of the assets that are touch that email server because that email server was hot. Let's go. Crap. Okay. I'm going to have to start moving a little faster, uh, Clint, just because um, we have a meeting at two, but I actually have a contractor coming at two and I need to do something downstairs before that contractor gets here. Um, all right, so we have we have a issue. Let's inst like so this machine is compromised. So let's put some stuff on it, um, and then activate IR. Okay, it's gonna things that take one turn. Okay, and activate IR. Oh, <clears throat> cool. Probably should have done a, a restore point, given that it's a file server. But there we go. IR mode activated. Very good. Let's. Um, gather forensics. Let's disconnect and then gather forensics. Oh, I thought you, oh, you got another, oh, I didn't, I missed that yeah. part. I was looking away when we had another one compromised. All right. So That's I like went all in server. on, huh? That's your SharePoint server. Oh, it is overlapping UI bug. Yeah. All right. So we're, we're, we're starting to get popped. We're starting to, you know, be worried about it. So this thing is still there. It, upstream connection's been done. We're gathering forensics and cleaning the assets, so that's fine. We've got one resource um, left to do something, so let's use it on thread hunting on this guy. The one item left in the network segment that we haven't done yet. Me being on the OT side of the house, I'm happy that it's you know that the compromises are sitting in your server network, and my OT network is left alone. Yep. Okay. Okay, so the 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 thing Ooh. has been cleaned. It's looking good. We're going to reconnect. Huh? 37% threat intelligence score. Yep, we're doing awesome. We're going to reconnect that upstream connection. And we have to deactivate IR, which takes a turn. So we have to use our two people on IR type stuff. So let's do that. We'll do threat hunting up here. And we'll do threat hunting here. Blue team, good. Very good. What is this? Missing AV, we can fix that. Oh, I have to, oh no, no, IR's down. All right, so let's install AV on this guy and go back down here at this mail server. We're gonna put patches on it and let's put patches on this too. We're only Probably. eight turns from a weather the storm win. Yes. This is perfect though. What that means for those of you watching, weather the storm means we have outlasted the red team. And I think maybe the default, I think is 75 turns. You must have it set in your settings as 50 turns. But basically if we are able to hold off a red team victory for the, uh, when turns expire, then, then we win all, not all clear, but we would, we win the weather, the storm victory. Mm hmm. And now I'm just doing some threat hunting over here on the, um, I'm really shoring up this area because it's clear that the threat actors are interested in this area, which is great. You can see we have nothing we have no issues in the ICS environment, so that's tight. Notice from a threat um, assessment perspective, we noticed earlier in the game that the adversary was taking a physical security route and was they unable to get in thanks to the video surveillance, uh, and it was a big part of that. And it, we don't know if they tried dropping any USBs, but they don't appear to be successful just due to the fact that um, you know, we probably implemented our USB security, but they pivoted. Now, instead of going physical, now they found a way into the server network. Mm -hmm. 
and they because they're so noisy because of our tooling <laughs> we we have focused like the eye of sauron all <laughs> assets all resources to the corporate network so you know their their butt is is red they're not happy about it the change in default creds all right i feel good i feel good we're going to update the firmware so this this is all tight over here let's get our terminal server cuz they may actually begin to veer away from this because they're getting their butt handed to him here so that you know like you said pivot right so let's install av here and one thing we didn't do so we didn't implement a vpn which means if they were to actually land a social engineering campaign attack it could be anywhere in the network when you put in a vpn here in game if you land a successful uh, successful remote attack or social engineering attack they're corralled into the dmz Oh, that's perfect. Because uh, we didn't do VPN, but we did get notified that our social engineering defense was way up. So yeah. that's great for us. Uh, endpoint security. This is perfect. Default creds. Let's 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 put EDR on Clint's laptop. Nice job, Clint. Yeah, I'm suspect. I'm always putting shady stuff on my laptop. Sus. Okay. I'm Carl. Yeah, you are Carl. Okay. <laughs> You can start saying Clint in the in your Simply Cyber chat if you want to. I will. So you don't offend Carl's. Oh, I'm feeling good about this. Here. Um, let's harden this system. I don't want to do threat hunting there. All right. We really need to fix Clint's machine. I am feeling good about the storm, though. Yes. Yes. This is good. We're going to win, Clint. Yep, I think let's, we are. Let's harden it. Let's harden it. Let's harden it. Here we go. Red team fail. And it, there's usually a one turn. You'll have to get. You'll have to finish your last turn before it's officially over. Oh, that's okay. I'll put EDR on everything. Patch like we're supposed to. I put EDM on everything. <laughs> I feel good. We just got a bonus. The holiday party is going to happen, Clint. Look at this. We absolutely dominated. Look at that staff utilization. Where is it? At the bottom of the blue oh, team's guide. 99%. That's right. I am a task master. I will keep you busy if you work for me. Believe me. If you look Threat at the results, you can... mm -hmm. If you look at the results, you can see what we missed. Man, oh, look, they did have our historian compromised, but wasn't able to do anything with it. And there were still a lot of vulnerabilities we didn't discover. Very nice. Very nice. All right. Look at this. So they got the email server. They got a network device. We don't know which one. Actually, that's it, Clint. They, they got the PCS recorder, but did not know what it was. Yeah, probably. <clears throat> yeah, they they well because it doesn't give you control over anything, only visibility. So they knew about the PLCs that were in the historian, but they weren't able to get to them. Nice. One of the look so, at this, FYI, if you look down there, this is the pro version. There's a save report button that you can click on that actually downloads the all the actions and results and everything of the entire game so that you can analyze that later. Yeah, let me let me see really quickly because you can't I'm sharing the screen here. Is it get ingested into something or is it just the, the file itself? We have a template we'll be releasing soon. So it'll get put into that template. So it'll analyze everything for you. However, in the meantime, it's a CSV format, which if you open it up in Excel, you can actually do an auto analysis using a tool in, um, in Excel, but you can also push the, those CSV reports into any other ingestion tool that you might have. Oh, perfect. Yeah, we'll have to take a look at that. I'm looking at it right now. I don't think it'll show good on stream. So uh, maybe when we release 1.8, we can we can add the the report functionality to the end of the stream as well, Clint. Right. And then the portal itself, the pro portal itself, actually does collect and show all the metrics that you saw and the, on that end game screen. If you go back to the uh, go back button there, Jerry. So this is shown at the end of the game. In the pro portal, these analytics and metrics are all stored for so you can so you can show historical trends of your performance, your team's performance, etc. Awesome. 
Well, guys, thanks for uh, hanging with us. Like I said, we'll probably be doing this Let's Play once a week. Uh, different players, different analysis, maybe playing as the red team next time. Uh, you know, hit hit follow or subscribe or whatever it is on the Threatgen YouTube channel if you want to be made aware uh, when we're going live. Like I said, it, this should be weekly. We're going to be doing a War Stories, which will be more of a traditional podcast uh, with engineers and operators talking about true stories from operating in the environments and also um maybe like a, a weekly deep dive on industry topics so there's going to be a lot of content coming out not just let's play but if you enjoyed it hit like tell people about it we'll have a good time clint thanks for being here genuinely appreciate it and we'll see you in the next stream okay yep thanks everybody